that's abysmally low. If we thought, you know, gee, everybody who had heart disease, only 10% of the people could get treatment. For everybody with cancer, only 10% could get treatment. It would be an outrage. I mean, it really would be an outrage but from, a, from a medical health and health care perspective. So it's a big deal, the, the treatment gap. And physicians you know, being trained in the ability and supply and demand of it, the market dynamics both from the treatment center, but just the number of physicians that are able to and get to register to be able to do it. It's one indicator of, of the workforce supply. Who can prescribe buprenorphine or methadone? You have to be certified to be able to do it and get a, a license to, to do this, be able to withdraw people from it. And in Colorado, we're among the lower in terms of, of penetration of that sort of physician registration per capita. We don't have availability, no matter how you measure it, to try to get people off of, of prescription drugs. Even if we want to do it, our capacity is very low. So it's, it's difficult. Uh, it's, it's, so you see this. You know, the tide is very strong, but we have to try to, to do something about it. So a little bit of understanding, I thought, is worthwhile about how we got here. Well, how did we get in this mess? It's a, it's a big mess. We know that I'm not going to do a presentation on risk factors for prescription drug abuse. There are many about addiction that, that you could spend a whole course talking about the whole curriculum, and we probably should, talking about addiction and how people get into this problem and how can we prevent it and all of that, but that's another topic for another day. I just want to acknowledge that it's a very complex biological, environmental, and psychological process to deal with addiction. It's not just simply someone took the drug and they overdosed. There's a lot going on between here and there. The availability has been cited as a big issue, that just generally the availability of prescription drugs, including opioids, but not just opioids. But for example, in the drug distribution through the pharmaceutical supply chain, legitimate channels of distribution only, not counting illicit drugs or black market for prescription drugs, which there's a strong black market for it. In 1997, there were, each person in the U.S., uh, there was enough distributed through the supply chain that each person in the U.S. could consume 96 milligrams of morphine equivalents per year. Which is, so that's as though every single person in the U.S. received 96 milligrams of morphine. And there's different forms, so we standardize it to morphine and say, well, what if it was all morphine? How can we standardize? So 96 milligrams per person in the U.S. in that one year. By 2007, 10 years later, that's up to 700 morphine equivalent. Uh, in the U.S., it's an increase of, of over 600 percent in that time, in that decade. It's a big deal. It's a huge growth. It's not mirroring population growth. It's not mirroring the increase in supply of doctors. It's it's not not going along with any of those trends. That 700 milligrams per person is enough for everybody in the U.S. to take one five milligram Vicodin tablet every four hours for three weeks. All 335 million people in the country. It's a lot of opioids. Is, is the bottom line, a lot. Uh, what are the causes of the increase? People hypothesize many things. And I'm not really here to, to point fingers at why we're here. It's just that it's a complexity of factors that also got us here. It's a complex problem. It's a multifactorial reasons why we got here. One was the increased recognition of pain and under-treatment of pain that when I was in graduate school and in pharmacy school, this was, these were the things that we were taught. Pain is under-recognized. Pain is under-treated. There are a lot of people with cancer and, and long-term chronic pain fibromyalgia, back pain, all sorts of things that aren't being treated well, neuropathic pain, and all sorts of pain that aren't being treated, and we, we don't recognize it and we don't treat it. And we spent 10 or 15 years banging that drum. And that's, you know, to some extent that is legitimate. We don't want undertreatment when there are effective drugs available to treat pain, because that's cruel. It's just not a, you know, I, I would argue that I agree with it completely. It was in, it's got to the point where there were campa ad cam you know, campaigns in the professional societies that pain should be the fifth vital sign. I don't know if anybody here remembers that, but I was in school when that happened. Pain is the fifth vital sign. The Joint Commission on Accreditation of, at the time, hospitals, but now healthcare organizations, even used the pain as a you know, fifth vital sign. If you weren't documenting in the chart that you're measuring and asking about someone's pain, you got gained for not providing quality care. And those incentives are very powerful to hospitals and health systems if you get dinged in the, in the JCO requirements. So people are, hey, well, then we're going to ask everybody if they're having pain, and if they're having some, we're going to do something about it. So there's a, a, a legitimate trend towards that, which is, I think, well-meaning. Well Pharmaceutical companies, look, they have a direct interest in selling more product. And, you know, there are laws about overpromotion and inappropriate promotion and all of that, but, but they're very effective and they're very good at what they do. If there is a market need, they will find it and they will, they will market to it. And that's what we would expect, free market economy, and that's the way our system works. I would expect them to do that as long as they're following laws and not breaking laws. I don't have any problem with that either. If we don't like it, we ought to change the laws or change the economic system. But that's another day. It's a political science class, and it's, it's not an epidemiology class. 
uh, practitioners are not terribly well trained in opi opioid pharmacology or addiction. It's, it's true. Pharmacists, doctors, dentists, across the board. You might get some psychiatrists that are, or some physicians that have specialized in pain medicine and, and pain management that are. But again, they're very rare. We don't have very good penetration of those folks. You know, I know on a handful I could probably refer people to in Colorado that are really, really, really good at it. But it's just not that many. So we need to do a lot better with, with training physicians at all levels, existing physicians and in the curricula, pharmacists, nurses, dentists, veterinarians. Everybody needs to be educated better as to how to safely and effectively prescribe opioids for those that need them and to watch out for those that don't. Uh, drugs are very, these are far more powerful than people think. There's misconceptions, and other, you know, many of them that, you know, especially youngsters and, and young adults report this, but, but people across the age span believe that prescription drugs are safer than street drugs. They're less dangerous. They won't kill me. That's common, commonly reported in surveys, that if I take a prescription opioid like Vicodin, that's not dangerous like taking heroin or something like that that you would get off the street. When in fact, pharmacologically, do the same thing. Very powerful opioids, all of them. So people I just don't think realize that. And there's a, just kind of a misconception about it. if it's a prescription drug, it's safe and it won't kill me. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, among many, and there's, there's other factors, but this is just a few, um, scamming, doctor and pharmacy shopping, the black market for opioids, there's a, there's a market for this. Go around, whether it's to feed someone's own addiction or for economic gain, to scam you know, doctors and, and pharmacies and go around and try to get as much opioid as you can because the street value is about a, a dollar a milligram. So, if I, you know, so an 80 milligram you know, oxycodone or hydrocodone would fetch 80 bucks per tablet. For an 80 milligram tablet. And if you want to get 40 of them, then you do the math, three grand. Or if you want a, a prescription of 40, it would be three grand out on the street to get it. Very, very expensive. And so some of that now is as we reduce that supply, heroin is cheaper, black tar heroin is cheaper than going for getting hydrocodone and oxycodone. So we do have a problem with that. Yes? Just a factual question. Um, when you first have these kind of opioids for generic, or are still like Almost all the opioids, well, hydrocodone and oxycodone have been generic for years. There are brand name versions of these drugs, and then there are new formulations of the drugs that are tamper resistant, and those sorts of things that are encouraged, and they're both good and bad. The tamper resistant forms are harder to crush or snort. They become, they look like they, they turn into paste. You really can't snort them, you can't inject them. And so it's just, well, all you can do then is just take it in your mouth like you were taking the tablet. So it's to discourage the abuse. But those are both very, really good because they discourage the, the rapid onset, the abuse, and they're you know, long acting, so they, they, they don't produce quite as much euphoria, they produce pain control without the euphoria, so that's great, but then they're very expensive, extremely expensive. Whereas a you know, generic Vicodin, you know, hydrocodone or an oxycodone tablet will cost you three or four cents, these will be you know, $2 a tablet. So we have a problem, and then when we have cost issues, you know, we all know how much you know, we're all flush with, with tax money to pay for, for things, and everybody wants their insurance to go up, and everybody wants their co-pays for prescription drugs to go up to pay for the new products. We all want that. So we're fighting both of these things at the same time. Well, we, want the, we want it to be cheap, but we want the abuse deterrent formulations, which are under patent for several more years. And they do, they're, and they're very costly to, 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 to develop. Each people, you know, people don't realize that to develop a new drug and get it to market, estimates are between one and 1.5 billion dollars to successfully develop a drug all the way from inception to market. So there's a lot of cost to recoup before you can start making money and all that. So I don't, you know, if it were so easy, the industry does make a lot of money, but if it was so easy, everybody would do it. It's very hard to get into that industry and succeed in that industry. So we do see that states with higher opioid sales and use, rate, use rates also have higher death rates, not, not surprising. The more of the stuff going in to the system, the more availability, the higher the, the death rate. So you can see that the, the uh, supply is in a little, the little uh, yellow circles, and the larger circle, larger supply per person, and then the darker rates and the square, the uh, square is darker blue is more, more death. Uh, so you can kind of see it generally does correlate. More, more supply going in, more opportunity for this to be available, and, and we see that's just what you kind of expect. Uh, tr Rates of opioid deaths, sales, and treatment admissions all seem to go in, in, in concert, which we would expect. Okay. This is another reinforcing point. It is true, though, that the majority of uh, opioids are consumed by a small percentage of patients. So it's not like when I said everybody could be taking this much in three weeks. That's not how it works. It really is. It's a smaller percentage of people get an awful lot of morphine equivalents per day. There are you know, those getting over 100 milligrams of morphine equivalents per day 
that's a percent of the total opioid, opiates consumed, about 63% of them, are by people who are on these high dose. And that's probably you know, terminal you know, you know, cancer patients with pain, long-term pain that has you know, developed a tolerance and a threshold to it, they're being legitimately treated and, and followed and all that. So there's very legitimate reasons why you might. But it's, again, a small percentage of those that are taking the very high doses in, in that, that respect. It's also a small number of providers that tend to, to prescribe the larger quantities of these. It's not every prescriber prescribing them all over the board. About 8% um, of the providers prescribe 79% of the drugs, and that's depending on where you go. This is the Oregon Prescription Drug Monitoring Program data, but various sources show similar kind of 80-20, you 90-10 know, rule types of things that you see. So it's a small number of providers that prescribe the large quantity of, of uh, opioids. That, and again, same thing, top 20 percent of prescribers accounting for those patients, accounting for the majority of deaths, for, as, you, as you would well imagine. Again, this is from uh, Ontario data, but all over. No matter what, though, we, the, 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 what we do see, the more patients you have on opioids, the more you're prescribing, the more you're likely to see doctor shopping. And doctor shopping is where you look into the PDNP data and you see the, the frequency with which somebody sees, here's how many patients that I'm prescribing for. I'm prescribing for 10 or 100 or 1,000. If I prescribe for 1,000, it's much more likely that a few of those are going to be doctor shopping and scamming me and may not have legitimate pain and are going to see several other doctors, going to several pharmacies. And, and we know this as well. So this suggests, you know, systems-related you know, issues that we doctors just aren't aware. Patients are very good at it, and it's, it's sometimes very tell, hard to tell with subjective symptom like pain that someone, oh, they're absolutely certain they don't have pain. It's a, it's a difficult thing when we don't have a marker. Can't do a blood test and tell you how much pain you have. So it's, it's difficult. Uh, interestingly, there's not just the, the supply, though. It's, it's, you know, so that suggests some of this is through the legitimate channels. There's also that non-medical use in the past month that I talked about a little while ago. Uh, the number that people have heard about, probably you know, we're number two in the U.S., is the number lately that we hear about uh, in the press and in, in circles, that the non-medical use of prescription pain relievers by persons 12 or older in 2010 it's about 6% here in Colorado. The national rate is 4.6. This is where we rank number two. And this got the ire of the, the governor, got his dander up saying, wait a minute. We, we, we want to be number one, but not in this. This isn't where we want to be number one. So we need to do something about it. And this led to a lot of the, the issue. We hear about this. Only Oregon was worse at about 6.4%. This is reported, non-medical use in the past month, of prescription pain relievers. So this is specifically of opioids, not just... I, you know, I took my, no one's going to take it. I took my friend's blood pressure medication. Not much, not much, not much reason to take that. Where do people get them? You know, people think, well, you know, it's just the black market. I go to the doctor. Most of the time, people get them from friends and family. The people that report it say they got them from 55% free from a friend or relative and or bought from a friend or relative, about two-thirds of it. A lot of this, the free stuff obtained free from friend or relative, when you ask further, it's the medicine cabinet. Just walk into your medicine cabinet, or I visited my friend, and yeah, I got I to use the restroom and go digging around. So we, we try to tell people as part of our work that you treat prescription drugs, especially opioids, like you're storing ammunition or a gun, that it's that dangerous. You wouldn't leave it lying around. You wouldn't leave it anywhere where a kid or someone you didn't know could get a hold of it. Lock it up. You know, we, we, that's what our counsel is, is to, to not just treat it where you hide it, put it in the medicine cabinet. People know someone who's looking for a bike and knows right where to get it. It's not, not a surprise. And why is this all important? Because, again, this is the uptick in heroin use. Uh, among those that are uh, uh, people who report using heroin in the past year and are admitted to treatment facilities for heroin abuse, then say, well, where, where, how did this start? Is it only heroin? And only heroin basically was, uh, uh, or, excuse me, the age of first use. This is looking at um, uh, opioid pain relievers and in relation to when they started on heroin and people that, that took both. The vast majority use the, the opiate pain relievers before initiating heroin. So it's, it's the you know, gateway drug and it moves on to this. And when the supply gets exhausted, it tends, it tends to be friends and family's medicine cabinets. I'll, I'll buy them from friends. I'll go to the doctor. I'll try to scam the doctor. I'll go to the black market. And when all that sh you know, shrinks up for the opioid, I'll go over to heroin. And that's the path that people tend to take, and exhausting one and progressing to the next. So it's, it's very serious. It obviously ends up now, and that's what we're seeing last weekend in the paper, in you know, the Post a week ago or eight days ago now, whatever it was. Boulder Community Hospital, yes, we're seeing a spike in heroin admissions. And, but gee, look at that. Almost everybody we ask says they started with prescription pain relievers. 
Absolutely true. They've done a really good job in, in, Grand, in, Grand, Can, in Grand Junction. I think I said that's Mesa County over there. But in Grand Junction with their high intensity drug trafficking efforts to cut down. And they, they busted a couple of, of pill mills and places where people could easily go in and get a prescription for opioids and basically closed that loop and made it much more difficult to get it illegitimately. And at Mesa State College, they've seen several heroin overdoses in the last year, more than they've ever seen. So it is happening, and it's an issue. We have to figure out what to do about this overall, but uh, it's important. So what is being done? There's a lot of targets, a lot of places where you could try to intervene. You know, and this is just examples. The, and this is something that the uh, CDC put together, so I have to give um, uh, Chris Jones credit. So I didn't put this little graphic together because I'm graphically challenged. You can see my white and black, and that's all I can do. Cut and paste and like more. But they put together this fancy graphic that basically shows you know, almost anywhere in the supply chain and the legitimate healthcare chain are places where we could try to intervene. And you can look at try to, to decrease pill mills or look at problematic prescribing, look at general prescribing to try to improve it, uh, hospitals and emergency departments. And there's a lot of guidelines now being developed in EDs for hey, how do we how do we handle people that could be drug seeking? How do we try to ferret them out? How do we handle them? What do we do about this? How do we use the PDMP? What are our guidelines for opiate prescribing? New York says you can only prescribe a certain amount. They've enacted a law by law, so you can only prescribe so much in the emergency department said. Sorry, we can give you three days by law. So the doctors have an out there basically to say, look, I, I, I can't give you any more. I can give you six tablets. And so there's different ways of doing this there or through pharmacies, through insurers, looking at obviously we want to target people at highest risk for overdose first. That's where we want to go, but there's general you know, we don't want to ignore the rest of the population say we don't want to have any prevention efforts for people in general. We want to have a broad-based prevention strategy. Um, could we utilize Medicaid's lock-in program, one pharmacy, one doctor, and scale it out to, the, to those identified in the PDMP? It's been talked about.